Hello, I'm Linda Garvey. I'm an artist, storyteller, communications consultant, and a former corporate executive. But no matter what role I am involved in, what I really am is a person very, very passionate about creativity. And I have come to realize not everyone is passionate about that, and not everyone understands what creativity is. In fact, a lot of people seem to think it's some mutant gene that is in the DNA of some people and not in others. That's not what I believe. I believe we are all creative and we can all be more creative. For me, creativity is really about the ability to solve problems, to make choices, and to ask that famous what if question. All of those things go into creativity no matter what role you're playing. And my goal today is inspire you to use your creativity or to increase your creativity. You may not think you're creative, you may think you're creative. Either way, we can all increase our creativity. And to begin with, I'd like to share with you some of my creations. This one is called Melting Rainbow and was done several years ago when I was wanting to design wall hangings for large spaces. And, you know, to use a small piece of yarn, it just isn't substantial and it can't hold up and be visible in the space. So the creative challenge was here was, what could I create that would be substantial enough to make a wall hanging that was really visible and stood out in a large space? So that's when I decided that I would use swimsuit material, which is stretchy material, sew it into tubes and pull it over these big cotton cords, then create large wall hangings which could stand up to those big spaces. So in this case, the creativity was about a challenge of a situation needing a wall hanging in a huge space, and my creative resolution was this melting rainbow. This basket is an example of how you can take a creative solution to another problem, the wall hanging you just saw, and expand on the technique. In this case, the creative leap was made when I realized I could take one of those wire geranium baskets and thread this large cord through it to create these decorative baskets which coordinated with the large wall hanging. So creativity is springing one idea to the next. Here is another one of my adventures in creativity. She's part of a series called Flights of Fancy. And this was inspired by a gourd bird I saw in a gallery in Galena, Illinois. And once I saw that bird, even though it was very realistic looking, it used a gourd and had real feathers on it, but I loved the shape of the gourd and I added my creativity to do a different interpretation to create a series of birds called Flights of Fancy. All of them have a different attitude based on the shape of the gourd. This piece is an example of my work in Palmer clay. And this was a result of having gone through exercises in mixing colored clay. And at the end of those exercises, I ended up creating this box to demonstrate what I had learned about color. And the creativity here was learning a skill through Maggie and Lindley's book about color then applying it in a creative way to create this box. The inspiration for the box comes from a botanical garden in Chicago, Illinois, where they had a heritage garden, which means long ago the gardens had one kind of plant in the garden. So one garden might have ferns, one might have mushrooms or fungus, one garden could be bamboo, one garden could include Queen Anne's lace in it. And the top represents a fantasy garden created just in my mind. So the creativity here was using a new skill, interpreting an idea that I had seen. So today, what we're going to talk about is Palmer clay. I'm going to use examples of my Palmer clay work to encourage your creativity. And this is not a step-by-step -step video. This is a here are ideas to consider that you could incorporate into your work. So I want to show you some techniques, but the real value of this is when you take inspiration from what I have done, learn from the way I've used the techniques, and incorporate it into your work to increase creativity. I would guess everyone working in Palmer Clay has a box a lot like this. This is full of things that I can use for textures. It's got buttons, rocks, screens, all different kinds of things I've thrown in this box that might be possible textures. And when it comes right down to it, the world is just full, full of textures. And today we're going to look at the subject of creativity through the idea of how to use textures. 
Here's one of the items out of that texture box. I don't even know where I got this, but on the front of it, as you can see, there's a series of circles, holes, and on the back, a series of squares. So this tool works for a couple of purposes, and it's a very, very simple design, and I do like repetitive designs. And here is an example of a sheet of clay that has been cured that has the side that had the holes in it to make the texture. So one tool, one texture, very, very straightforward. But to get creative about it and to add to it, I use this tool, that crinkle blade that you probably all have, and took it down between each line of circles, pressed it in, wiggled it back and forth, and created a wavy line between each of the rows of circles. Then I decided I would like even more texture. What could I do to add to it? And I took this chain out of my texture box. And as you can see, I laid it right across those circles, pressed it down, and pulled it up out of the clay. So I went from a basic tool that gave me one design, and then I added two other options with two other tools. There's just endless possibilities of what you can add. And one of the really great things about polymer clay is if it doesn't work out, you just recycle it and use it again. It's not expensive. You can use it over and over and over. So you can feel free to go ahead and experiment and not worry that you get it just exactly right. I really like to use this plastic screen because it has this very regular design in it. And I have quite an assortment of these kinds of screens in my toolbox. Some of them are large like you would use for a needlepoint. Some of them are small like this. Some of them are not textured, although the hole doesn't go all the way through. But I love that regular design of that texture. And this is a sheet of clay that was made using this texture. So very, very uniform, consistent grid. From that, before you cure the clay, one option is to add paint. Rub paint down into the grooves, which gives it an entirely different look. So you're taking one texture and it's looking very different. And in this case, you can see where these plastic grids intersect, there's a tiny indentation that creates a small uh, dent in that that holds the paint. So that's one option, one way to add creativity to that very, very plain sheet. Another way would be to brush copper dust, dust, copper powder over it to create a sheen like that and great, creates an entirely different look. Same basic sheet, two very different looks, very different color, very different uh, reflective surfaces. And then a th another option with texture is this particular piece is this very same thing, but I stretched the piece and distorted the texture. So just because you use a tool to make a texture, it doesn't have to stay that way. You can distort it and create a whole other design from it. When working with this particular texture, I decided I would like to make a pair of earrings, very simple, straightforward earrings, and here they are. And what I did to that surface was use a foil sheet on top of the raw clay, pressed in the plastic sheet, and then used scotch tape or packing tape to lift that foil off the top bumps of that. Now that's very, very simple, but came up with a very unusual earrings. I've never seen anyone wear anything like it, and I get compliments on them all the time. So very simple, step by step, finding a texture you like, adding to it, changing it, and creating something that you really enjoy. The minute I saw this bead in the store, I instantly knew I would like to use it just as a bead, like in a beading project, and I also knew I would love to use it for a texture. That radiating texture looked so interesting, and I thought it had a lot of options. So I purchased it in two sizes, the small one and the large one, and actually, when looking at it and thinking about using it for texture, I thought I should adjust it a little bit. So I bought another one, which I stepped on to flatten. So then I had three very different shapes, similar but different, and could use those as options for creating a texture. And once again, 
I like those uniform consistent textures. Here is a sheet where I have used these pieces. You can see that this piece was used to make the larger shapes and my small bead was used to make the smaller shapes. I just repeated those over and over to create that texture. And of course you could overlap them, you could do the uh, pressing in in very different ways, many many ways to use such a very very simple thing as a bead. Now to take it a step further, this sheet was made using these same tools. In the center you have the small bead and then going to the outside, I took this and just used the edge of it and rocked it back and forth to create those indentations. So one tool used in very different ways, and then the third way I used it was these lines radiating were made by rolling this bead. So very different looks, very simple tools. Here is yet another way that I use this wonderful bead that I have. I cut circles from the clay and then press them into the bead. Created multiple discs, which then, as I said before, you can distort. This one has been pulled and fluted up. And I made a whole assortment of these in a gold color and then arranged them together to make a large focal bead for this necklace which has a kumuhimo cord and this clay focal bead all made from this same bead that made the flat textures I just showed you using it to make these small disc textures. Yet another way, a creative way, an alternative for using this bead. In addition to that, I wondered what would happen if I used that bead to make textures on one of the canes. These canes are, look like a pansy or a flower, and I decided to slice those canes and then press those into that bead, and the, what was created from that were shapes much like this. Those I then used for a project called Postcard Art, where you create a piece of art that is four by six, that's the reference to the postcard, and these were, were used in fundraisers for scholarships for art students at the local university. And in this particular one, hidden within that postcard art are a pair of earrings that are attached to the postcard, made with that bead pressing into a slice of a cane. In addition to all the things that you can find and just repurpose to use to make textures, you can also buy things for textures. This is a tool specifically for polymer clay and uh, I purchased this and I particularly like this texture here so I rolled a piece of clay and cut a thin strip pressed it down in there to create a texture and used that shall we say store-bought texture combined with the texture of the screen that I showed you before to create this pin. You can see this is very similar to the earrings different color of foil there, but this was the same idea for the center, then adding one more element, which was strips of clay from that mold to create yet another variation on a theme. This is a cheap plastic button that I found at the fabric store. Love the design and the texture of it, and thought there might be a lot of ways that I would like to use that in my work. So I took the button, and created a mold from it. And you can make molds from all kinds of items and it gives you a lot of options. So with this button I would have the option of pressing that texture down into the clay or using the mold to make a reproduction of that button. And here's an example of how I used that. You can see on this pin that this is the mold I used to make this element and the clay had foil over it before I pressed it into the mold. So see the similarity to the button using the mold to create that element. And the other element in the background was this simple placemat which I pressed the clay into to create that. So two separate elements, foil used different colors of foil on both of the pieces to create 
this pin with a matching earring set. Once you find some textures you like, at least if you're like me, you'll end up finding that you repeat them throughout your work. And here's an example of that. You will recognize that center from this mold, made from that mold, and you will recognize that edge made from this mold. So very different looks. These two used the mold that I purchased, these two the button that I purchased, and this one the placemat. So put together in different combinations to create three very very different looks. Here you'll see yet again a repeat of some of those elements I've told you about before. You'll recognize my famous radiating bead there. And here is the button pressed into it here. These elements along the top edge were made with this needle just digging down into the clay. And there's the chain that you saw used on the very first piece I showed you and an additional element down there which came from this gear, a plastic gear and I once again have no idea where I got that but this not only had, would have the option of pressing straight down but of rolling it along to make a continuous trail. So those items were used to make that and then this very simple balling tool which came from a cake decorating set pressed in and rotated around at different levels created that line of indentations. So similar tools, very very different look than anything you've seen before and once that was cured then you have the opportunity of taking another sheet of clay and pressing it into that as if it were a mold to make a reverse and a reverse can look very different than the original imprint. So that is another variation on a theme that you can add to your creative toolbox. Once you're used to looking for opportunities to find textures, they show up all kinds of places, all kinds of strange places actually. Here's an example. When I was visiting my mother washing her dishes, I accidentally let this silver spoon go down in the garbage disposal destroyed the spoon so I ordered a new one for mom but I took this home and put it in my texture box and all along I kind of had the idea that I might be able to make something from it that I could give her for a gift so I decided to use a molding compound to make a mold from this spoon and these molding compounds you can find tutorials on the web you can find all kinds of molding compounds and they are truly amazing this particular one can actually be cured in the oven with clay in it but after I made the mold from the spoon I then once again here you see that famous plastic button that I made the mold out of but I added to that three pieces of clay that also had foil over them but were pressed into this mold of my mother's spoon. So this particular pin has three elements that came from this spoon that I retrieved from the garbage disposal. One of the great things about creativity is once you have one idea, more ideas branch from that and come to you. And after I made that pin for my mother, I made this necklace. And once I had used her spoon to make the elements of that pin, I decided that I would use grand baroque silver that I inherited from my Aunt Betty to make a bale for a necklace. And so once again I used my molding compound to make an impression from the handle of this knife and then I covered clay with silver foil, pressed it into it and made this bale. And that uh, reminds me so much of my Aunt Betty who I got the silverware from. In addition I saw an opportunity to use something else that I collect, cut glass, and this cut glass piece I also made a mold from. And that mold then was used to create this center medallion and it has an iridized foil over it and 
this may be hard to see, it just gives it a little bit of an extra sheen like glass. So I combined a molded piece from my cut glass collection with a molded piece from Aunt Betty's silver to create this necklace, which is a memento, a reminder of my aunt. Earlier I showed you an example of what I called a store-bought mold, and that particular mold was made specifically for Palmer clay. But there are other molds that you can also use for Palmer clay. These two molds come from the candy and cake decorating industry, and this particular one is full of possible seashell shapes and is very flexible and I've used to make elements for different pieces. This particular mold is actually two-sided and used to make a flower and that would give impressions or indentions on both sides. So you can be aware of all kinds of things can be used as molds. You can find them many, many places. And this is an example of a mold made specifically for Palmer clay. And that texture can be used over and over and you wouldn't even recognize it in different applications. Here's one that I did using this mold. And I used the Sutton Slice technique, which you can find plenty of videos on how to do that, where I used a gradated color background and then pressed a gradated different color into here and sliced, sliced it off to create that interesting texture. And done in different colors, done in solid colors, it would be very different. So one tool, many applications. This necklace was inspired by a story I wrote about fall, and the necklace is entitled An Artichoke and a Hedge Apple. And you can see many different textures in this necklace. On some of the leaves, the textures were just made with a pointed tool where I scarred into the leaves. Um, slight serrated textures on that from a mat that just had little tiny grooves in it. And then this hedge apple, the whole necklace actually happened when I was going to write the story about fall and I was on a walk and saw a hedge apple. I picked up the hedge apple and really wanted it to be part of the necklace. So from the hedge apple, once again I used the molding compound to make this mold, which then created that element of the necklace. And if you're interested in hearing the story, you can go to Garby Designs on YouTube and the fall necklace is listed there under an artichoke and a hedge apple and you will see how I executed all these textures. I've saved the sweetest example of using a texture to last, and it was inspired by this beautiful antique tablecloth that my mother gave me for Christmas one year. It's just a gorgeous piece, and I eventually decided that I should have a tea and use this particular tablecloth, and I decided I wanted all the elements of the tea to be white, and of course I wanted to have it a theme. So I used this design on this tablecloth, and I made a photocopy of that design, then I reproduced that in clay. Just on a flat sheet of clay, I made all the dimensions of this grape leaf and some of these tendrils. Once I cured that, then I could make a mold from it. And this is just odds and ends of clay that I used to make that mold inspired by this tablecloth. This then became the texturing tool for the fondant icing I used for the cake. So this is an example of a texture made by a Palmer clay tool and there's no end to those things that you can do with this technique. It's not only making a finished piece of Palmer, a piece of jewelry or a display item, you can use the clay to make a tool to make impressions in other media. And the uh, tea was a huge success with my cake inspired by this tablecloth. As I told you in the beginning, my goal was not to create a project that you would duplicate, but to show you some ways texture could be used that you might incorporate into your projects or get onto the idea of how to find textures and the great range of how they can be used. So you've seen textures of things I've found, like the plastic screen. You've seen textures from buttons I've bought, from beads. You've seen textures from store-bought items. You've seen textures that were created inspired by a tablecloth. There is just no end to it. The world is full of textures. And it would be a mistake to think that the goal was to go out and collect hundreds of different items that you can use to texture things. Creativity is not about the volume of things you have. Sometimes creativity is about taking one item and seeing how many ways you can use it. So I hope 
that these ideas will find their way into your work. Nothing changes in your life or your world without creativity. Creativity is essential everywhere. And certainly aspiring to perfection isn't all it might seem to be sometimes. It is good to know formulas and exactly how to mix a perfect color. It's good to know how to make a very precise shape. But however, if you learn only that and then you only duplicate the work of others, you are not using your creativity, you are missing an opportunity to use your creativity and you're not changing your life or the world. No matter whether you're cooking something, doing a redesign of a room, or inventing a cure for a disease, creativity changes outcomes. When you increase your creativity, you make a difference in your life. Creativity is a renewable resource. It can't be used up. In fact, the more you use creativity, the more of it you have to use. So go out and solve a problem. Ask what if. Go beyond the perfect. Go get creative.